Welcome to the Great Debate 2. Okay, now you can talk. He's just like, there's something at the I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you to everyone who's present here. I want to thank, first of all, our fellow debaters on the, on the con side of this argument. I want to thank our judges who are here today. I want to thank all of you. There's a ton of students here. It's very exciting to see you all out here to really talk about uh, intellectual pursuits and how we debate these things uh, and how we have topics about this. I want to make sure that if you do, I know that you can't make noise, but give some spear fingers like this if you support the middle school side right now. We're excited to see you today. Thanks for coming out for our little middle school supporters. Uh, we want to make sure that you know today our team is charged with this task of defending this state. And as we just went over, the idea that the U.S. government should mandate testing in schools. This is a nuanced argument. I think when you immediately think of testing, you think, oh, testing is terrible. Testing is something we shouldn't have. It makes me nervous. It makes me frustrated. It makes me all D, all of the above. Now, when we think about testing, we want to make sure that we have a proper explanation of what we're talking about in this argument. Let's start with this question about what it is not about. So that way you get an understanding of what this not, about what we're not going to argue about today, what we're not trying to talk about. Uh, this is not about getting rid of all testing. No, not even the most strident opponent of testing and educational policies today says that we should get rid of testing. She says it's something that we need. It's something that is of value to educators, students, and families. Uh, it's, some, it's about the importance of federally mandated testing that has on our education environment here in our schools. We argue that the U.S. government should mandate testing for the following reason. Because it illuminates and raises student growth. It allows us to uh, allocate resources more effectively and more humanely to schools that need additional supports and helps us understand best practices for teaching. Let me explain a little bit more about what I mean about those three arguments that we're really going to hit on today in our debate. The first argument is about raising student growth. The NAEP test, which is National uh, Education, or Assessment for Educational Progress this is a test on every four years that may, uh, many, if not all, researchers, policy analysts, policymakers conclude is an accurate measurement of where student progress is at. It is separate from federally mandated tests, but it's used by everybody, so I want to make sure I bring it in. Uh, it shows that uh, since the introduction of No Child Left Behind, which is federally mandated testing, there's actually been growth in math in both fourth and eighth graders substantially uh, through the use of mandated testing on these NAEP tests. Nearly 14% growth in math since 2002, and in fourth graders, and 8% in Michaela Dodge to the front office, please. Michaela Dodge to the front office. Our second point we also want to talk about is the idea that by showing our first point, whether progress is happening or not, we're able to then figure out through mandated testing where we need to spend our money. We think of budgets as actual value statements. The idea that uh, where we put our money shows where we put our support, where we value. This is an important thing to help us understand where we should allocate. Uh, one of the things that this does, and it's introduced, is the idea of Race to the Top. This is a program we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, throughout our presentation. It's where the federal government said, okay, we've looked at our test scores. We saw that there was some improvement in some areas, but there was not improvement in others. We're able to know that only through mandated testing, showing that, yes, there is progress, no, there is not. This Race to the Top then says, we're going to put our money where our mouth is. We spend an additional $4 billion for states to then say, with their own choice, where do they want to spend money? So the federal government said, above all, this is what we'll do. Then the states, they gave money to the states and says, okay, at each local level, you're then able to decide what's science. best for you and your students. The third thing we want to mention is the idea that we come back to our point, is that it has supporters even in its most ardent and strident detractors. Uh, Valerie Strauss is an education reporter who then now becomes a commentator for the Washington Post. Even she has come out and supported testing and has the following quote, again and again, Teachers speak of the need for feedback on their practice in order to become best, the best teachers they can be. Plus, they are open to hearing from a variety of sources. I'll end by saying this. And that's time. Oh. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Do me a favor. Can you hit the right arrow on my computer? Yeah, there we go. Ms. Dodds, you have four minutes to present your opening. Mr. Payne, you can have a seat for the moment. <laughs> okay. Are you ready to begin? Um, yes. Three, two, one. All right. Welcome, everyone. Super excited that you came out today to see us. Uh, like Mr. Uh, Kane and Mr. Parks, I want to say thank you for all coming. We're very excited to see students interested in, you know, intellectual boxing, basically. We're very excited <laughs> that you're here, and hopefully you'll join the debate, 
2019. Um, we, of course, are on the side that the federal government should not mandate testing in schools. Um, and some of the things Mr. that uh, Lee, the other team and basically throughout Mr. there is causing to encounter now um, with the negative side to that or the side that they were unwilling to tell you. Um, the first thing that they mentioned was that there has been an, inc an increase seen in student growth on these tests, right? Um, that we've seen that these have been helpful to our students' ability to learn and that their test scores are reflecting that they are learning better in schools than they did before Nickleby, No Child Left Behind, and Race to the Top, which is the current educational mandate in the United States. Um, what they have actually seen in many studies, uh, but in particular the Washington Post in 2015 found, um, that score gaps on the NAEP, which is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which has been around since 1964 Mr. and was put Dallas, in place to show that two, one, students five, in poverty four. in particular Mr. were Dallas, getting a similar two, education two, one, to students five, who were not in that situation, has actually gotten no narrower and often wider between 1998, 1990, and 2012. So basically, we've had these tests for the past decade, and we are actually at the same, if not a worse position than we were at about 25 years ago, okay? Um, they have found in particular that students who qualify as ELL, English language learners, students who have a different background, native language at home, have seen a bigger gap between them and students who speak English as a native language. So that's an entire population of students that we are seeing no growth, and it's actually they're falling behind other students. Um, they have found in particular that, well, there may be in, tiny infinitesimal growth in junior high schools and in fourth grade, that in high school the scores are basically stagnant, that they have not moved, um, especially for black and Hispanic students in the time since these uh, laws have started to take place. Um, the next point then, allocation of money. He was talking about that these things are a huge benefit to our schools because we get all this tasty, delicious money, all this money that we know we desperately need. But what we need to point out to you is testing is a business, okay? We are not the only ones benefiting from this money. What they've actually found is no child left behind. When this was put into practice in 2002, when this was passed by our government, um, that it was actually put together with input from the Business Coalition for Education Reform, the Business Roundtable, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and other state Chamber of Commerce who basically have an interest in seeing that students are learning certain things at certain times because that is their future workforce, okay? And basically because businesses have influenced uh, what we are doing in the United States, um, we are focused more on data than what students are actually learning, and that is no way to educate a student. The third point is that this is giving us best practices. No, I do not think so. What we are seeing instead that schools are dropping arts, second languages, social studies to make room for test prep, and that the average student by the time they graduate from high school, um, that the, student, the average student by the time they graduate from high school at, tests approximately 113 times from kindergarten to, to the time that you graduate. That includes things like standardized tests, uh, like the, like the um, Scantron that you do, but also it's things that depend on your ability to graduate, and that is just not right. Cool. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Kane, please join Ms. Dodds up here. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kane and Ms. Dodds will now engage in a two minute crossfire round. Beginning in four, three, two. So um, what I would like to know if I could begin was um, a little bit more, if you could explain a little bit more what you mean by this is increased student growth. Because when we were looking at the data, um, we didn't see anything that definitively showed that this is helpful to our students in any way. Sure. Again, I want to go back to the idea that the NAEP test, which is not a federally mandated test, but agreed upon by teachers and educators and policymakers across the United States, I have shown that said uh, we have shown growth on that. Now we're not arguing whether testing is good or bad. Again, that's something that the, the other side wants you to understand when we said we're unwilling to tell you things. What tests do is they illuminate either gaps or raises or increases in student potential and in student progress. I think that's the important thing to see. So in this NAEP test, which mandated tests that then help us say illuminate, hey, we need to teach this a little bit better, or we need to work on this, or this is something that we're really strong on. We've been able to use that through mandated testing and then to show growth on tests that are not necessarily tied to the standards of 
the things that you're talking about when you're like, uh, they come with strings attached or are written by business coalitions, well, we'll get to in a second. I need to follow up and say that then. Uh, the thing that struck me about you talking about business coalitions or leaders in the business community making tests or helping write that, why don't we want people who are working in 21st century businesses helping to drive the standards of what children and teachers need to be teaching to help create a 21st century workforce? Um, I think that currently you're actually, I'm sorry, um, you're actually kind of ignoring a bigger point, which is what is the purpose of education in general? If we look back at the history and the philosophy of education, it's to make well-rounded people, right? Um, one of the things that we want to look at is creating civic-minded people who are interested in being good citizens. Um, and while, yes, it may be true that you need certain skills to be able to be successful in the workforce, I think what we're looking more at the United States is creating a holistic person. And as it is, when districts are slashing their funds um, from uh, classes that will make people more around the the people and putting all of their money into testing. Thank you, Ms. Dobbs. Thank you, Mr. K. <laughs> <laughs> you may both have a seat. Mr. Parks. You are up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kutcher. You will have four minutes. Yep. You can't ask for prep time. continue what uh, my colleague Mr. King was sharing uh, and talk a little bit again about why we think the federal government should mandate testing. Uh, in uh, our opinion, if we look at um, some of the skills, and Mr. King brought up 21st century skills, we can look at other professions right now that require standardized testing in order for that person to work with you as a citizen of the United States, as a person. I think of Dr. Mackey, my two sons' pediatrician. Uh, my younger son has had an operation, he's five and a half now. I don't want somebody uh, operating on my son who's a well-rounded person. I want somebody who's operating on my son who has taken a test and passed a certain set of standards that says, I am ready as a doctor to operate on this person. Similar to a lawyer, uh, similar to um, pilots, I don't want to be ready for those people to provide these services to myself or anyone for that matter without knowing that they are ready to do so. Um, uh, I also want to share that standardized tests, there's the strong opinion that um, everyone, parents, teachers, uh, and students are opposed to standardized tests. Um, if we um, look at, uh, there's been a number of um, surveys uh, that have been done in the recent past, including surveys of teachers in 2006 in the state of Minnesota. And what we see is that uh, parents are 93% of parents say that standardized tests should be used to identify areas where students need extra help. Um, if we look at uh, children, it's 61% say, yes, this was helpful, and teachers being able to say to me, this is where we can be able to support you. It's information. It's something where we could use it to help somebody be a well-rounded citizen. But how are we supposed to know what that is without that information? Um, so we see standardized tests as a way for the federal government to say, this allows an outlet for us to understand who you all are so that we can better service you, we can better work with you uh, to help you be those citizens that you'd like to be. Um, <clears throat> uh, and there are also, and I want to bring this up as a, a last point, uh, there are, uh, a lot of this uh, has come out of a uh, result of these world standards and where the United States falls in the ranks of the world according to some of these test scores in math and science and reading. And um, there are other countries, including China, which has a long uh, history of using standardized testing to be able to assess their young people. Uh, after 2009, they surpassed Finland, and they were the top country uh, performing on, um, on science scores and on math scores. Uh, according to the Program for International Student Assessment, which is a, an international, so a whole world ranking where we see those rankings. Um, of other countries. Um, <clears throat> if, um, if standardized tests were an unreliable source of data, 
then they wouldn't be such a widespread use. And I'm not talking about just in schools, I'm talking about in society. Standardized tests are used in a variety of places. So if it's been so unreliable and so ineffective for so long, why are they still being used? In fact, Diane Ravitch, who is um, a huge, uh, 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 somebody who's very much against standardized tests, she speaks out very loudly, has said standardized tests have a place. They have a place in society. And if they're used appropriately and they are valid, and we, I think both Mr. King and I would argue that that should be vetted so we know that's true, then they have a place and they can be used for a positive thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Good morning. Assume will be the greatest presentation anyone's ever heard. And Mr. Bernardi, in three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank my opponents for being here. This is not an easy thing to do. I know if I were asked to debate myself, I would probably turn it down. <laughs> I want, to, I want to tackle a few of the things brought up by my opponents, um, maybe some misunderstandings they've had about what we're discussing here. They, they have brought up the point that they are not arguing whether tests are good or bad, just that they are mandated and they should remain mandated. But shouldn't we argue whether they're good or bad? I mean, questioning whether something is good or bad is how we determine whether we want to keep it. And I personally do not want to have a bad thing in our schools. And I think we've had decades of evidence to show bad things in our schools that once we acknowledge they're bad, they shouldn't be there anymore. These tests, as useful as they could be, as enlightening as they could be, are hurting our children. They're hurting our students. They're hurting this audience. Um, <laughs> John Oliver reported, how these tests, you have students crying and vomiting during the <laughs> test from pressure that extends directly from this information. Now, how is a test going to determine whether or not you're doing well if you can't even take it without crying or vomiting? <laughs> I believe that hits the validity of the test, and I believe it is that mandate that is putting that pressure on the test. There's another thing that my opponents brought up about Finland and how they're on top. Good old Finland, right? I'm sure we can all point to it on a map. The problem with using international standards to judge our students is we're not like the rest of the world, and we know that. And I don't say that because I'm proud to be American, but I am. I don't say that to the way I'm saying it because those countries have completely different standards than we have. Even if they're using the same baseline test, their socioeconomic statuses are different. Their immigration statuses are different. Their belief in who should be testing is different. Their population is completely different. So if you want, I can hand you an orange, and I can hand you an apple, and I can ask which one is better. They're two different fruits. We shouldn't be comparing them. Moving along. Tests don't actually give us a reading of ability. Now, I know we've had this whole thing of, well, you're going to have to take tests in life. And I'm not, I'm not ignoring that. I completely agree with that. You have to take a driver's test. I had to take a few standardized tests to get my teaching license. But does that mean that all of you should be forced to take a standardized test because of something you didn't choose to do? I agree that doctors should take a standardized test. But I also believe that that is their choice and that is their schooling that they go into. Not everyone in this room is going to be a doctor. Maybe some of you are going to be lawyers, engineers, teachers, fingers crossed. <laughs> I don't think you should be forced to take a test unless you completely accept the pressure that it holds. Moving on. <laughs> like I was saying before, tests don't really give a true picture of the ability in students. Uh, we see that the scores... Um, if they have lower testing thresholds, you see that, uh, especially from the, this NAEP, sorry, the N-A-E-P data, 
shows that there are the, these amazing gaps in students. And should we really start measuring our students by their gaps? I mean, should we just become a math and English academy where we do nothing all day but practice our reading and how to fill in a bubble sheet, followed up by practice our math, fill in a bubble sheet? Like I said before, we're hurting our students. We're doing this a disservice. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Mr. Parks, would you please join Mr. Bernardi on the floor to begin the two-minute crossfire round. And uh, four, three, two. Mr. Bernardi, I want to thank you for sharing a quote from John Auburn, who's a comedian on HBO. It seems like a reliable <laughs> source to tell us that students are throwing up at tests. Uh, as a professional in education, I've actually never seen that. Um, but thank you for letting the comedian tell me that that is the case. Um, I wanted to also bring up, you mentioned China, that uh, China is on, um, was on top. I actually didn't say that. Or sorry, you said Finland. I, was on I top. did say Finland, yes. And I said China. <laughs> You uh, did. Finland was on top until 2008. Oh, okay. What's very curious to me is that Finland actually does not use standardized tests, and they were on top for a while. But Finland also, I might point out, is a very homogenous country. If we look at the people that they're assessing in that country, the amount of young people, the amount of people of the same racial background, the same religious background, uh, the same economic background, it would be like <coughs> saying for the state of Minnesota, Let's take Minnetonka and have that represent our state as our state uh, goals in terms of what we're actually doing. And these are our results for everyone in the state of Minnesota. Doesn't seem like a very accurate assessment to me. So I guess one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about um, is when you bring up this, uh, this, this China thing, we're, we're not actually talking about international tests. I thought we were talking about mandating tests uh, in America. Can you clarify? You know, let let me sure? clarify a few things because you, you <laughs> run the floor a bit there. I want to make sure I get a few things uh, straightened out. Uh, I brought up the international issue because you brought in the international issue. I, I wouldn't have thought to mention international things in a question about U.S. testing until you decided to bring it up. Uh, follow it up with, I just want to bring in, you, you kind of slammed Mr. John Oliver there and uh, obviously he is a comedian. However, he has been cited by federal judges as an accountable source. So you know, maybe he's not an authority on it, but if a federal judge says it, I'm a little more inclined to believe it. Where, uh, do you have a Thank you, gentlemen. That is the <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kane. Crossfire, but it's a great crossfire. Mr. Kane, you will have two minutes. Are you ready? Yes, certainly. At the bell. There have been a lot of uh, things that the opponents in this, in this debate have talked about. They've given me option A, option B, they've given me option C. I'm going to tell you their answers are D, none of the above. Now, when you go through this thing, I want to make sure that I introduce a couple more arguments so you understand why we're in favor of standardized testing from the federal government. We're not arguing again if it's right or wrong. Mr. Bernardi's trying to pull on your heartstrings and talk about it's not working, it's making you throw, it's making me vomit. Well, that makes me sick myself. <laughs> now, I want to talk about the idea that at the federal government, the importance of this is because we prevent systemic racism uh, by doing this. We're going to talk about the idea if the federal government does not mandate testing, the idea that maybe that is up to the states. The states can do whatever they want. Well, before No Child Left Behind, before ESEA in the 1990s, 17 states didn't even have state tests. We had no idea whether or not state or mandated testing could illuminate gaps in between students of color and students who are, uh, who are white or different economic levels. What this does then is it creates opportunities for systemic racism to happen, to say, okay, you know what? We're gonna sweep this under the rug. We're not gonna do this. We're gonna make it unjust. We're gonna make it unfair because the states at the local level have more people who have more control, but there's more hands in the pot. The idea that the U.S. government does it that allows it to be unjust because it serves our entire nation. We're writing a test and understanding and mandating something that works to understand and serve our entire population. That's a very important thing. We also talk about economies of scale. Ms. Dodds brought up, it costs so much money for standardized testing. She's right. But think about then if uh, these, all the states had to negotiate these contracts with different testing companies, 
to a different organization with policymakers, with all those uh, individuals who help write the test. We're talking about taking even more money away from your classroom instead of having the federal government do one contract to save money in the economies of scale argument, the idea that we don't have to repeat that those processes all over all over the town. So again, thank you for making my point, Ms. Dodds. Thank you for making my point, Mr. Bernardi. Uh, I feel a lot better. I had a good school for Thank you, Mr. James. Thank you very much. Ms. Kane, you may have a seat for a moment. Two minutes. Two minutes? Yep, two minutes to summarize. When you hear the bell, which he wasn't able to figure out. <laughs> Um, before I start in on just reiterating some of our major points, I'd like to point out specifically to the judges uh, that during this particular round, uh, no new information is allowed to be introduced, and Mr. Kane did go on a lot about uh, systemic racism and all of that, but technically in judging that is not allowed. Um, I, did, did, I, did I say that correctly? All right, so unfortunately I'm going to have to ask you all to discount most of what Mr. Kane just said. Um, and in the meantime, I am going to now just re-summarize our main points and possibly add just a little bit new because evidence is allowed. New evidence is allowed, not new points. Okay. So uh, I just want to point out some of these things and I'll, I'll add on to them if I need to. So we are going to emphasize that we do not need federal testing mandated to us in the states um, around education because it doesn't show growth. We can't see any significant growth that would justify the cost and the stress on students. Um, it helps businesses more than we can see it helping our students. This is a major, major industry with billions of dollars going to companies like Pearson. Pearson, which has 40% of the testing market. Uh, Pearson, which has uh, tests that you take in kindergarten to, to 12th grade. Um, pra uh, dry uh, not even driving tests, what did I say? Um, li some licensing tests. Um, there's, I don't have it in front of me, but they do a lot of testing, I assure you. Um, again, that's John Oliver, but that is allowed by federal judges, so I'm assuming that that's okay to talk about here. Um, we are not following best practices. We are not educating students the way students should be educated because we're spending all of our time on tests. Um, we're comparing apples and oranges when we're looking at these international things, which again, the other side brought up, and not necessarily us. Um, and we don't necessarily see these tests showing us our students' actual abilities. Um, when we look at these scores, we're not looking always at what's being taught in school. We're looking at students' natural abilities, because let's face it, students aren't all equal initially when they are born. And we are also testing them on what they've learned outside of school, not just in the classroom. And that benefits students with money more than it benefits anyone else. Thank you, Ms. Dodds. Mr. Keynes and Mr. Parks, please join. We are now going to have one final crossfire. This is the grand crossfire. All the debate participants will be uh, engaged, and this is a three minute round. A reminder, as we get to the end of the debate, please be a good audience. If you want to continue side conversations, I invite you to take them out into the hall now. If you're going to keep talking to me, that's all right. <laughs> but it sounded so decorous. I know. I was trying to, you know, I'm taking my moderator to be serious. <laughs> At the bell this time. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know that we had to answer the first question. Your partner. Okay. Um, I, I want to ask uh, all of you, because I've, I've heard this thing about holistic uh, teaching, that it's not a good measure using um, standardized tests. Good intentions to us seem just not enough. What do you all suggest then, if not standardized tests? If I may, I believe this is not a policy debate. I believe policy debate is when we try to come up with solutions. We are just arguing on the particular matter at hand, which is should there or should there not be testing. Is that correct? But I'll push right? back. I'll this push back in these instances because you can wait a second. Oh, uh, the right. idea that, uh, uh, they just introduced a ton of new evidence in this last round about the ineffectiveness of testing, about what it has. We talked about the U.S. government fairly mandating it, and you're saying that we're, we're asking them what is the replacement for. We're trying to figure out where our students are at. Please, please help enlighten us. In the oh, I can definitely enlighten you. You're in a school. I don't know if you know this. We're an IV school. I don't know if you know about what happens with DP, but a lot of their testing is actually not testing in the standardized format. Instead, they do things like oral commentaries. They do practical labs to kind of show their learning, which 
why couldn't we do something like that? It's the same result in terms of, oh, have the students learned something, but more practical, more to the point. Wouldn't you like to know that, again, bringing up this doctor example that was used, wouldn't you like to know that your doctor, all the way back when he was 16, was already working on, let's say, a cadaver? I feel like that would be a much more, you know, encouraging idea than, oh, well, yeah, when he was 18, he did really well. He got like a 32 on his ACT, so. And if, I, and if I may, if I can give an example too, how many people do we know pass their written driving test just fine, but you would never get behind an actual wheel of a car with them, right? Um, you know, the standardized testing, an actual practical application might be better. Mr. Brownie, thank you for letting me know I'm in a school, and yes, I am. <laughs> and Ivy, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this other hallway. There's an N8 and an N9. There's students there that are in middle school. Um, I've actually never seen you down there, but it's a place where uh, there's younger people. I, I'm wondering if you are familiar with how sometimes the staff in the school determine what students might be a best fit for advanced classes. Because according to my understanding, there are times where we assess using these standardized tests, Scantron, MCAs, where we look at student scores and we say, this student is excelling at a reading level according to their peers at this level. And so we want to look at, this student might be a better fit for this class. Real quick, because I got 10 seconds. I don't think they're using the federally mandated MCA scores. I think they're using the Scantron scores that we choose to use as a school, which that's what they're using. So it's we're not saying you shouldn't well. use tests, but they shouldn't. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
it is out of passion that we come up here and speak today. And, and I must, again, I must thank everyone in the audience. I must thank my opponents because there couldn't be a debate without two sides. I only have a few things to say. We won this debate. <laughs> I have more. We won this debate. Um, my opponents admitted that standardized test is one of the ways that we evaluate students, but not the only way. So I think it would be a fairly simple thing to just remove one of those ways if we already have other ways in place. My opponents seem to be confusing the standards with standardized testing. Now, we do have national standards that we are in the process of adopting. Every state has not agreed on that. But I think they've definitely confused standards with testing. Just because we have standards, so when a student, let's say, wants to go to a different state after they graduate, they will know because they were educated in a school in the US. But I don't think they should have to bring their MCA score with them. I don't know what else to say at this point. I feel that we, we've kind of proven that the business end of this is a little shady. That when someone controls 40% of the market, are they really telling us what's in our best interest or what's in their best interest? When someone is allocating resources away from the arts, away from even band and gym and just all of those other classes to say they're less important, I feel like, what, what's standard about that? These are parts of people's lives. And to just go against them, I, I just can't support that. I can't support standardized testing as a federal mandate, and I really hope that you can not do that as well. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give the two debate teams a nice loud round of applause. At this point, uh, my fellow judges and I, we're going to have a quick conversation to discuss what we thought. And uh, we will be out in just a little bit to announce our decision as to the winner of the great debate, too. Stay tuned. <laughs> and uh, so far as Mr. Kane right here. All right, so <laughs> my fellow judges and I, we went in, we had a conversation. The team that we feel won the debate, won the debate based on the fact that they were able to more effectively undercut the arguments and the points made by their opponents. Something that their opponents were, uh, opponents were not quite as able to do in return, relying more on restating previous arguments that they made rather than rebutting or refuting the information that was given to them by the other team. And so, it is our decision that this debate, the Great Debate 2, goes to Dodson Bernard. <laughs>